learn about what others are doing. Uh, Dr. Cordes Aaron uh, has organized an industry panel, and she's asked uh, three industry panels to share us share with us information about their efforts and their organizations have uh, that they've taken to uh, uh, achieve sustainable livestock and crop industries. So. Each panelist has been uh, asked to provide a few prepared remarks on their organization's approach and plans towards sustainability and the tools and processes they've developed or used to help their members with sustainability. And then after the three presentations, we'll invite them back up for a Q&A. So you have uh, bios uh, in your program on page two, so we're not going to uh, read those. So you can take a look at those at your leisure. So it's my pleasure to introduce our first panelist. It's uh, Betsy Hickman, Vice President of Stakeholder Engagement and Implementation with Field to Market, the Alliance for Sustainable Agriculture. Betsy. Thank you, Kevin. It's great to be here with all of you here in Minnesota on a beautiful day. And so thank you for being here in the ballroom when the weather outside is, is very lovely. Uh, Marty had already shared a little bit about Field to Market, so I'm going to dive a little bit deeper uh, into who we are and what we do. And uh, an update for all of you, uh, in our messaging, uh, feed has become an increasingly important part in what we consider one of the next frontiers of sustainable agriculture for commodity crop production. And so Field to Market, our focus is on defining, measuring, and advancing the sustainability of food, feed, fiber, and fuel production here in the United States. And we do that uh, as a nonprofit, multi-stakeholder alliance that seeks to unite the supply chain from grower organizations to agribusinesses to food, beverage, apparel, restaurant, and retail companies to the broader uh, civil society community, including conservation uh, organizations. And uh, one of the most important sectors are public sector partners. So land grant universities, a collaboration with USDA's Natural Resource <coughs> Conservation Service. And as you can imagine, uh, the diversity of more than 140 member organizations that sit around the table at Field to Market uh, on any given issue, there's a variety of perspectives and opinions. Uh, we are based in Washington, D.C. From our office, I can see Capitol Hill, and on any given day, our members may be engaging the Hill on different sides of the same issue. At Field to Market's table, where they come together is a shared commitment around how do we advance continuous improvement in the sustainability of commodity crop production. And so it, uh, we hear often, um, you know, how do you define sustainability? And we define that as meeting the needs of the present while uh, preserving the ability of future generations to meet their own needs by increasing uh, productivity to meet future food and fiber demands, improving the environment, improving human health, and improving the socio and economic well being of agricultural communities. Some of the guiding principles that have shaped Field to Market uh, since our inception in 2006, uh, when it was just initial stakeholders sitting around the table from one another, is a commitment to engage the full supply chain. Uh, and that means ensuring that the voice of producers are at the table as we sought to define what sustainable agriculture looks like for commodity crop production, as we agreed on what are the fundamental metrics or indicators that we will utilize to advance uh, and uh, assess progress, and then what are the programs that we will use to advance continuous improvement? Also, uh, initial focus on commodity crops, recognizing that uh, the commodity crop supply chain uh, is, is unique, built for efficiency, economies of scale, uh, which brings uh, certain challenges as we think about how do you increase sustainability uh, and visibility into how food is produced without uh, placing any uh, undue financial strain on one portion of the supply chain to achieve that. Uh, as Marty mentioned earlier, um, some, some guiding principles that I think are important as we think about scaling sustainable uh, agriculture and scaling sustainable animal agriculture, how can we do that in a way that's science-based, that's outcomes-based, that's technology neutral, uh, and uh, uh, from field to market's perspective, that really looks at whether a, a producer is utilizing a conventional management system or organic management system, we really want that farmer to think about how do the decisions they make on, on their farm, on their operations at the field level, 
impact sustainability outcomes and leave the, the, the choice, the freedom to innovate uh, really at the producer level. Uh, but focusing that really also on how can they impact key outcomes that both uh, the agriculture value chain um, but broader society cares about. And so our emphasis is on continuous improvement, measuring broad scale trends uh, as Marty profiled in the National Indicators Report. Uh, but what I'd like to share with you today is some of the tools and resources that we have to support producers in measuring field scale outcomes and how those field scale outcomes can be leveraged by the broader uh, agricultural value chain. We do all of this work uh, really in support of an overarching goal, which is how can we get more producers engaged uh, uh, our goal is that by 2020, we'd like to see 50 million acres engaged in continuous improvement, engaged in sustainability measurement. That's roughly 20% of commodity crop production. Uh, and we think that that scale or that tipping point is important to deliver our ultimate goal, which is driving sustained improvements or sustained reductions in the key environmental outcomes that we'd like to see. And if at any point there's a fire alarm and we need to move, I'll let you um, decide as a conference organizer. Okay. Uh, and so we do that through our supply chain sustainability program. So I'm going to go through each of these pillars uh, here very quickly. Benchmarking sustainability performance, catalyzing continuous improvement, and enabling sustainability claims. To give you all a lens into how the food and agriculture value chain is working together to deliver sustainable outcomes uh, for commodity crop production. I'm often asked, what commodity crops do you focus on? Um, and so I want to share with you the 11 uh, commodities that are within our program. You'll notice many different feed stuffs in, uh, in our uh, 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 crops that we focus on. And so I want to highlight as, that, as an opportunity for us to explore today thinking about how the work that we're doing with producers uh, uh, of, of grains, of feedstuffs, can impact and intersect with the work that you all are doing in the animal ag space. Uh, and for each of these commodities, we encourage producers to think about what are the management decisions that they make and how do those impact eight different sustainability outcomes. And so bringing together this multi-stakeholder alliance, we agreed on what are the eight fundamental indicators that we need to both um, measure, assess, and manage uh, to ensure that we're advancing the sustainability of commodity crop production. So those include water use, water quality, soil carbon, uh, soil erosion, land use, greenhouse gas emissions, energy use, and biodiversity. And so how that comes alive uh, is in our tool, the FieldPrint platform. Uh, this is a uh, sustainability analytics engine that powers both an online calculator that's free and confidential, available to any commodity farmer uh, to go on to fieldtomarket.org uh, this afternoon and begin to assess their operations, but it's also increasingly these metrics uh, that we've developed through a consensus-driven multi-stakeholder approach are being embedded into existing on-farm management software. And so we have five technology partners Organizations like Syngenta's LandDB, Nutrients Agrable, Land O'Lakes Truterra Insights Engine, the Illinois Corn, Corn Growers Association Precision Conservation Management Program, and my farms that are helping scale sustainability measurement, making that more accessible to farmers. And our vision is that whichever preferred technology provider a commodity crop producer might be working with, that these sustainability metrics would be uh, available right alongside that agronomic analysis. And so as a producer enters in uh, uh, their field, they draw their, their field boundaries and complete um, several different uh, question sets about their management practices, they receive what we call a field print analysis. This enables the producer to benchmark their sustainability performance against their, against their peers at the state and national level and uh, where they are participating in a regional project, they're able to compare uh, their performance at a peer-to-peer -peer level as well. <coughs> and so what you can see from this uh, spider gram, uh, the individual producer's uh, field print is shaded there in blue and they're able to uh, assess their, their progress against their peers at the state level with the, uh, the green square or at the national level with the orange triangle. And uh, where they're outperforming those benchmarks, it's a great indicator that they are uh, uh, having greater sustainability performance. 
where they're lagging behind their state or national benchmarks. That's an opportunity for improvement to consider in the next growing season. Or increasingly, as we are uh, facing more erratic weather events, to tell the story about how a changing climate impacts agricultural production. And so that's a key area that Field to Market is focusing on in the next uh, 12 to 18 months, is trying to make that connection between our, our wetter wets and our drier dries and, and how that impacts sustainability and how we can help build uh, more resilient uh, producers in, 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 in that changing climate. The work that we're doing with producers at the field level also has merit and value to the broader food and agricultural value chain. And so I'm highlighting here, we have 56 field print projects across 33 states uh, in, uh, in the US. And these are field to market members. Um, so in many instances, it's a food and beverage manufacturer with some key members of their supply chain partnering with producers in a specific geography around a specific crop or set of crops. Um, and as uh, you can see today, there, there's a lot of diversity in uh, commodity cropping systems that's covered by these projects, um, also geographical diversity. Uh, the one element that I want to highlight, all of these projects are largely within the apparel, food, or beverage supply chains. We have not yet had a project focused on feed. So I want to highlight this as an opportunity uh, that we would love to pursue broader collaboration with the animal agriculture uh, sectors to, to see how we can go to ground to really help uh, tell the story of producers that are uh, able to document and demonstrate the impact of their conservation and stewardship that can also contribute to the sustainability story of animal agriculture. And last but not least, uh, the third pillar in our supply chain sustainability program focuses on enabling sustainability claims. And so this is the opportunity that as we collect this field level data, how can it be aggregated in a standardized fashion um, that's anonymized, protects growers' data privacy, uh, but enables the broader value chain to uh, demonstrate that sustainability story. And I think this documenting and demonstrating uh, our sustainability story is so pivotal. Uh, as you see on the, on the slide here, there's many different voices right now that are filling uh, uh, the uh, courts of public opinion, uh, that are filling uh, the airwaves. How can, how can agriculture take an active role in documenting and demonstrating the solutions that we're providing? And so I want to highlight just a few examples of some budding collaborations that are taking place with Animal Ag. Uh, in 2015, Field to Market and the Innovation Center for U.S. Dairy signed an MOU, which formalized a commitment to harmonize on-farm sustainability metrics and drive greater collaboration between our two organizations. <coughs> and so the goal of this MOU is how do we create a consistent approach for measuring and advancing continuous improvement in the sustainability of dairy feed production. Uh, first, by seeking to harmonize metrics. Are we measuring in the same way? Uh, how do we maximize the interoperability between our tools? And so we have the field print platform. Uh, the Innovation Center has several different uh, technology platforms that they're utilizing. How do we join together to advance scientific research and communication while also jointly convening the supply chain to tackle sustainability challenges? Uh, which started just four years ago with the Sustainable Agriculture Summit, which has now grown to include uh, all of the different uh, uh, agriculture sectors, including animal ag, but also specialty crops. Um, so some exciting advancements from this work. And so I want to give you an update. Uh, we formed a Dairy Feed Sustainability Task Force, which includes joint members in both Field to Market, as well as the Dairy Sustainability Alliance that the Innovation Center runs. And they've been working together to establish uh, corn for silage and alfalfa fully into Field to Market's tools and programs. And so the Field Print Platform version 3.0 that launched last fall uh, now has alfalfa and corn for silage incorporated, ready for any producer today, thanks to the commitment and collaboration from the Innovation Center. Uh, we have joint members in both of our organizations that are helping contribute to this work. And three major areas of discussion and, and calibration have been identified by that group. First, benchmarking development. Um, so we've, we've learned through this process, 
there are some important data gaps in, in our ability to tell our story. And so how can we fill uh, that data gap specifically with alfalfa? Uh, there isn't enough national data across the country to produce reliable benchmarks for a producer to, to inform meaningful uh, sustainability assessment. Um, but then also the integration into our tool and what I'm most excited about is later this year, we're going to begin piloting uh, with uh, three different dairy cooperatives uh, what uh, sustainable dairy feed looks like as they engage upstream, both for what they produce on their dairy farm, uh, but also engaging uh, the, the different commodity crop producers that they source from. Similarly, uh, we have a partnership with the U.S. Roundtable for Sustainable Beef. And I don't want to steal Ben's thunder. He'll be speaking in just a moment. But I wanted to share with you a, a shared commitment between uh, the commodity crop sector and the beef value chain uh, to pursue continuous improvement in the sustainability of beef. And feed being such a critical part of that, we signed a letter of agreement in December 2017, formally recognizing one another's role in defining uh, sustainability. And so USRSB recognizing field to market's role in defining sustainable production for feed, and field to market formally recognizing USRSB and defining sustainable beef production, and encouraging our members to work together where applicable to utilize uh, the joint resources, uh, the sustainability metrics that field to market has developed, the sustainability framework that the US Roundtable for Sustainable Beef will be launching uh, just next week. Uh, to pursue how can, how can we unite these assessment approaches together. Um, and so this, is, this has a, a joint task force uh, with shared members between our organizations that has just begun this work. Um, they, they've been uh, stood up within the past uh, 12 months. And so their scope of work is identifying where do those opportunities for collaboration exist between our organizations. How can we identify both areas of engagement, but also gaps between uh, our, our relevant approaches around sustainable feed production uh, to both gain knowledge and connect the two food systems? Also to identify shared areas, including where are there overlaps in key metrics or indicators that we're both measuring and thinking about how to tie those two together. Um, also identifying feedstuff utilized and whether uh, those are covered under the commodity crops that Field to Market's program focuses on. And I think the most exciting and burgeoning space, and uh, we've had some meetings recently, uh, getting both of these pilot projects better defined, but how can we shape both an approach to a farmer feeder model where uh, in states like Nebraska and Iowa, beef producers are sourcing corn or other feedstuff. Um, in some cases, they're growing that directly on their operations, uh, but in many cases, they're sourcing that directly from farmers that they know. Uh, to then the more hairy challenge, how do we tackle increasing visibility to sustainability performance? How do we tackle advancing continuous improvement in a very complex feed supply chain? Um, so I hope uh, that maybe this time next year, I'll be able to update you on where we're going to ground and how we're tackling that. Um, but know that there is some exciting work underway uh, to get that started. So I want to close with an opportunity to all of you. We have NRCS in the room, we have extension educators, we have um, technology providers. There's an opportunity here to unite animal agriculture in documenting and demonstrating continuous improvement in the sustainability of feed. And uh, corn, soy, any of these foodstuffs, they're all produced the same way regardless of what animal is eating it. Uh, so can we think about opportunities to unite and share resources together? Uh, we heard about platforms from the Dean this morning. Um, animal agriculture is a true platform, and so where can we bring together the right stakeholders, the right partners, um, to accelerate this and allow agriculture to tell its sustainability story? Thank you. to hear from uh, Dr. Brett Kaysen, Assistant Vice President of Sustainability with the National Pork Board. Brett? Well, good morning. Thank you for your time and attention today. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to stand in front of you today and present on all the great work um, that pig farmers across the nation are working on every day and the support of the checkoff as they go through that journey. 
As an old professor for 17 years, it was fun to see all the students down in the lounge pounding on their laptops, right? It must be getting close to finals week is what I think. And so um, what I want to talk to you about today is the leadership role in which pig farmers across the U.S. are taking in this space of environment. But quickly, I know you read my boring bio, but I want to make it a little bit more personal for you and why I'm so passionate about what I do as the Assistant Vice President of Sustainability. But in my heart of hearts, I've always been a pig farmer. And the two little girls that you see up in the, in the top, those are my two daughters. We're passionate about this business. We're specifically focused on the purebred registered livestock business. And so when I speak to you, I speak to you not only as a scientist, uh, a sustainability uh, expert, but also a pig farmer with my heart and soul. You'll also see the red barn with the snow. That was not taken in Minnesota. That was taken 30 miles south of Des Moines, and I will tell you, my entire life I lived in Colorado for 45 years. I moved to Iowa a year ago, and I experienced my first polar vortex. And so um, I got frostbite and lost my hair. So if you're wondering, I survived it okay. Let's level set, though, I think, in terms of the business case. And really, when we talk about sustainability, I like the fact that Dr. Matlock said, well, 10 years ago, we'd come to these conferences and figure out what the definition is. And his next comment was, but I think we know what it is today. Well, we've agreed on social and environmental type impacts, right? But I do think sustainability is defined differently depending on the business unit in which you represent. And that's talking from my experiences in working in the retail food chain the last 14 months. But if we can keep those core pillars that we're unified around at the, at the heart of what we do, I think we'll be successful. I challenge you to look at the numbers on the screen and what I'm asking you to do is understanding the environmental impact, but not only the economic impact, but also the social impact that pig farmers have in this country. In the US, we have approximately 60,000 pig farmers that market 125 million pigs per year. That produces 25 billion pounds of pork in which of that 25 billion, approximately almost 26% of that is exported. And so when you think about sustainability, we're thinking it strategically beyond our borders. It's important domestically, no question, but it's a significant piece of our business. The job creation in this country is outstanding in terms of 550,000 jobs, and that creates about $66.7 billion in downstream revenue. I show you this slide so that you get an idea of the economic impact in which pig farmers have that not only we have to protect, right, but promote and create to growth in this space. When you think about the global challenges and the global level in which U.S. pig farmers play, they've really been the most responsible and they've really been the most innovative to push us towards our definition of sustainability at the National Pork Board, which is incremental change over time that equals continuous improvement. Some examples. This work goes all the way back to 1983. We've really been chasing this quality, consistency, uh, sustainable product. And it started in 1985 with a program called, called Pork Quality Assurance. And essentially that program takes on-farm practices and assures that farmers are doing that in an appropriate way. It collects that information, you become certified and you share that down the food supply chain channel. We figured out we had a gap though, as we learn more as we go down this space, and the gap was pig farmers were doing a wonderful job. From the time the baby pig was born, six months later we're putting the pig up a ramp. Marty talked about pigs and movement, right? Market hogs are going on the truck, and then we figured out we've lost control of our product. We've put that responsibility now on someone sitting in the front seat of that tractor trailer, taking that product, live pig, to a packer processor. And so we decided we need this transport quality assurance program that not only makes sure pig farmers are doing things well, but those that are taking those pigs to market are doing things well. And how they handle them as they unload into the marketplace. See It Stop It is a national program, which essentially says, and unites the barnyard that says, if you're on a farm, whether you're a visitor, whether you're an auditor, whether you're a guest, employee, CEO, if you see something that's unacceptable in terms of animal welfare behavior or animal well-being, you stop it. There's no repercussions. You don't have to worry about losing your job. It's the right thing to do. And then finally, we took it a step further in terms of continuous improvement. It's one thing to be certified in Port Quality Assurance Plus. It's another thing to have a third party auditor come in and make sure that those things are happening. And really, this was response to the supply chain. We had several packers 
when we, in this country we really have seven major packers that harvest the majority of our pigs and they all came to the pig farmers with different individual audits that they'd like to see done on farm. Well I always say for every pound of pork we produce in this country, we produce 11 pounds of paperwork. <laughs> and the last thing that we needed was seven different audits for pig farmers to go through. And so we created the Common Swine Industry Audit that now is verified through a third party audit system with PACO as a partner. Take a deep look at this symbol. And I want you to remember a few things. And that is, this is our sustainability framework for the pig industry. Now I can show you graphs and all kinds of funny glo or fun glossy images, but at our heart of hearts, We Care is our sustainability framework. We Care is 11 years old. It's had a decade of success. And it's based on our six ethical principles. Some of you may have heard of We Care. What my job was in 2018 was to rally a group of producer leaders of 15 plus non-government organizations, plus packers and retailers, plus working with Ben and his group, bringing in Dr. Stackhouse Lawson and get them around the table and allow day one for retailers and NGO partners to talk to pig farmers about their needs. The pig farmers had to sit and listen for a half day. Those of you that know farmers, that's tough. But we learned so much from that as pig farmers that Actually, one person even said, quote, unquote, some of your practices I have to whisper about in my corporate suites. The second day of that listening session, we flipped the switch, and the pig farmers had the opportunity to address the supply chain and talk about here's things we can do better, here's things we're already doing, here's things we need to think about. And what we found from that dialogue was a couple things. Pig farmers are doing amazing work. A lot of times we're not taking credit for the work we're already doing. So one of the task force outcome strategies was share the story of continuous improvement on behalf of the producers, but also then thank you supply chain community, you helped us identify opportunities to augment what we currently do. And so it starts with principles. It's an e easy formula. Principles plus practices plus proof should equal and garner public trust and more confidence in our product. Principles I heard someone talk about on a podcast yesterday, those are different than rules. Rules you can break. Principles, if you don't adhere, adhere to those, they can break you and they can break your business. And so what are our ethical principles? Six, food safety is paramount to us and we view that as not a label claim. We don't view that as a benchmark. We view that as table stakes. Food safety is what we do every day. In order to feed into that food safety profile, it's imperative that we have animal care. My dad always taught me growing up on the farm, if you take care of the sows, the sows will take care of you. As an eight-year-old kid, I didn't quite get it. I think we get it. Environment is of paramount. We are committed to safeguarding our natural resources. We know without those, we are not in business. And more importantly, we don't have the opportunity to pass that on to the next generation of farmers that we're passionate about. Public health, the work that we do in the animal health space the work that we're doing in the antibiotic space in terms of protecting public health is important as well as other things we do with that ethical principle. Our people, for a long time, that ethical principle was worker safety. The task force that we put together said we do more than worker safety. It's about our people. It's educating the people that drive the feed trucks. It's educating our veterinarians. It's educating our community members. So that changed to our people just recently. And then finally, the communities that we live in. Big farmers are passionate about being good neighbors. They understand to do what they need to do. They need to be good neighbors and be active in their community. So we, based on those core values, or we'll call them principles, those six ethical principles, we put practices behind those. And so I could talk for days on all the practices, but I'll just touch upon a few of them in which Dr. Matlock has really led us off with this morning. And it's about pig farmers are more efficient than ever. Talk about sustainability and doing more with less. Here's a prime example in that in 1959 it took eight pigs, including breeding stock, to produce a thousand pounds of pork and today it just takes five. That's from 1959 to today. How did we do it? Technology, enhanced genetics. How did we do it? The work of nutritionists. How did we do it? Better facilities. I remember as a kid gestating sows on dirt lots. In northern Colorado that's a lot of work. And better biosecurity. Also in terms of environmental measures, we are committed to using less, less natural resources. We understand, I think Marty did a great job of framing up why that's so important. And so surface water, air quality, soil health, and the land are paramount. 
I do want to land here for a moment, though. I love the poop emoji some of you have on your name tags. And I was just going to donate to the poop emoji out there on the table just because I could, not because my phone went off air. <laughs> but really, as an animal scientist over the last 14 months, my strategy has been, and you may find this funny, celebrating pig manure. Celebrating pig manure. It is not waste. It's a, val it's a valuable asset. I can take you to parts of Minnesota today, the state that we stand in or sit in today, where pig farmers have purchased farms that were tired and old, utilized pig manure in the appropriate, appropriate way in terms of rate and how you put it in, and actually have data points that suggest because they've incre increased organic matter, soil health and fertility has increased. They've reduced their commercial fertilizer use. They've increased the absorption of the water into those soils and that biodiversity piece as well. And so here's a piece we've not leveraged. I had the opportunity to go in February to a meeting called Green Biz. Some of you may not be familiar with it, but Green Biz in Phoenix was made up of 1,400 sustainability professionals from all over the world, corporate suite types. The theme this year was a circular sustainable economy. I would argue, thank you for the work you folks do in the crowd, what's more of a circular sustainable economy than what livestock pig farmers do? We plant the corn and soybeans, it grows. We harvest that in the fall. We feed it to the pigs. The pigs do this thing called what? Poop. We harvest that poop, we put it back into the soil, and then what do we do? We come back about this time of year and we plant corn and soybeans again. And it goes on and on and on. Nothing more natural, organic, authentic than using animal manure in a space to increase soil fertility. We're passionate about that. So prove that you care, pig farmers, and that's some of the things I've been working on over the last 14 months and will continue to do so is, it's one thing to say that you care, it's one thing to say you're passionate about it, but you have to prove it. And thank you, Marty, you set me up extremely well. A latest study that was done at the University of Arkansas, a retrospective look back from pig production in 1960 through 2015, dissected the data in five-year increments, and it says now that per pound of pork produced, we utilize 79.5 less land. Now we have to thank our row crop uh, brethren, farmers for that. They've become more efficient with bushels per acre. We also, because of the way we're housing pigs, can take credit for some of that. One of the things that I've learned is that, how, what does that mean though? To the lay person or consumer or the eater of our product, what does that reduction look like? We've actually run the analytics on this. This is like taking an 18 hole golf, golf course and putting it down to four holes to put it in consumer messaging. Our water use has been reduced by 25%. What does that mean for consumers in the US? That means everyone in the United States would have to take 90 less showers per year to save that much water. A reduction of a 7.7 percentage on our carbon footprint and then an energy use of a reduction of 7%. 7% reduction of energy use relative to this LCA work that Dr. Toma and Dr. Matlock does equates to everyone in the U.S. would have to shut off their refrigerator for a year. I'm trying to put that in terms of the significance of the work that's been done. And so as well relative to public health, the Food and Drug Administration recently reported that in terms of antibiotic sales, there's a 33% decrease in animal agriculture antibiotic sales. What does that mean? We're doing a better job in terms of prevention. We need to continue to get better in that and focus on well-being. <coughs> I used to work for Zoetis, the largest animal health company in the world. The dean spoke to that earlier. And I would tell you at times, I believe we as producers have used antibiotics as a crutch. But we need to make sure we protect that tool that when it is needed, we can use it appropriately. Excited about the memorandum of understanding that we just signed in November last fall with the United Soybean Board and the National Corn Growers Association. And what that MOU essentially says is, you as USB, NCGA, and the National Pork Board will work together, together and pool resources of sustainability research. Marty proved to you today that the largest footprint for a pound of pork produced is the row crop in which the pigs consume. And so that work with our checkoff brethren, and to be quite frank, in a lot of places, as you know in the Midwest, pig farmers also raise corn. Raise corn. They also raise soybeans. They're paying into these three checkoffs. What better way to utilize those dollars more effectively and efficiently moving forward? And as well, this slide is important about collaboration. Thank you to Dr. Aaron Cordes in the University of Minnesota 
and also to Marty and Greg for their work on developing version three of the pig production environmental footprint calculator. It's an amazing tool that actually will give you your environmental footprint as a pig farmer. Now, as the challenge is, as pig farmers are busy, the adoption of this because of the extra work it takes becomes somewhat of a challenge. And so thank you to Dr. Cordes and her leadership. She says, listen, if you can identify those producers that we can work with, we as a team of researchers and our graduate students will actually help put the data in and model this for them. So another example of collaborations with our land grant institutions and what we're doing in this uh, calculator space relative to our carbon emissions. And so I'd leave you with this slide and if I can make sure you remember anything from my discussion, it's quite simply this simple formula that we're using as the basis of our sustainability framework called We Care that's based on the principles that we have, the practices we employ on the ground every day as pig farmers. I gave you some example of some of the proof points behind that to demonstrate continuous improvement with the business case in mind to grow domestic demand but also exports as well. And so thank you for your time. Today is going to be Ben Weinheimer, Vice President of the Texas Cattle Feeders Association and Chair Elect of the U.S. Roundtable for Sustainable Beef. Ben? Thank you, Dr. Yanni, and uh, thank you uh, for the invitation to be part of the program this morning. Uh, a couple of hard acts to follow here, actually, several all morning long, so some very good information already today. I'll try to uh, continue that trend. And it's, uh, again, great to see several familiar faces at the conference, and it uh, looks like you all had a great program and, and a great week of remaining uh, outlined going forward. So I've, I've been a, a part of the Texas Cattle Feeders Association staff for uh, almost 25 years, uh, born and raised farm and ranching in the Texas Panhandle amongst uh, six other brothers. So uh, it, it taught you early on that you had to be uh, competitive at the table in order to uh, get your fair share. And so what, what we've uh, uh, learned, uh, I think, in parts of that, uh, as we've heard this morning, how important food is to all of us and uh, the things that we continue to do to make improvements of, of how and where our, our food is produced. We've uh, focused on that uh, for the past several years uh, through this organization that's uh, been formed as the U.S. Roundtable for Sustainable Beef. I've had the uh, opportunity to be involved uh, since the days and actually even before we formed uh, the round table as there was several various initiatives within the supply chain uh, for about the past 10 or so years uh, that we're trying to figure out how are we going to wrap our arms around such a complex supply chain. Uh, a lot easier to talk about sustainability of marketing a, a consumer packaged good on the shelf if you're looking at something that's in a cardboard box or in a plastic water bottle, uh, a plastic bottle or so on but uh, much more difficult when you look at the very uh, diverse uh, biological system uh, that we operate when it comes to the U.S. Uh, beef cattle production system. So uh, officially we uh, formed and, and launched the round table in March of 2015. At the time we had a little over 90 founding members. Uh, today our membership is around 115 members in total. You'll see here in a little bit, uh, similar to some of the other initiatives, uh, exactly the diversity of that membership and what it takes to represent the full supply chain. We then uh, focused in uh, 2016 on, uh, on following uh, the, the model that Dr. Matlock uh, outlined under the ANSI ASABE standard uh, for uh, sustainability initiatives, where we uh, worked through a process to identify high priority <laughs> indicators and uh, followed that then in 2017 with a focus on these metrics of uh, now that we've identified these key areas of importance, these high priority indicators, what does it mean to at the operation level? Uh, what can you actually measure to help your own operation and help the industry as a whole uh, advance uh, to meet the, the overall goals and needs of the industry? In uh, 2018, it was uh, more about then uh, building that out further. So taking those uh, high priority indicators, these metrics we had worked on, which were kind of the question based uh, high points that are important to those operations, and then fleshing that out with supporting information, some tools and resources to again, uh, help them evaluate where they're at in their own journey and how they can continue to improve. 
And then currently, uh, as uh, we're going into our fifth annual General Assembly meeting of the Roundtable next week, uh, we will collectively be launching this entire, what we've termed, the U.S. Beef Industry Sustainability Framework. I'm going to dig a little deeper in that to you here and unpack that so that you can see exactly how we put this together and, uh, and what it all entails. First and foremost, I guess, uh, is to uh, ensure, as we've mentioned uh, in all of these initiatives, the importance of having strong stakeholder engagement. Uh, these are uh, uh, challenging uh, organizations to assemble. Uh, they're challenging to assemble, uh, to establish a governance structure that's uh, fair to all the parties involved. Uh, but yet it's important to ensure that every aspect of the supply chain that's directly involved in the supply chain is engaged in these initiatives as well as those interested stakeholders. And you'll see more about that here in the next slide. So that became our foundation to ensure that we had a, a very uh, extensive engagement uh, representing all of the players in, the, in, in and out of the industry. Next, uh, our, as I mentioned, uh, has led to the culmination of the uh, sustainability framework. So we'll, we'll talk about that here this morning. And then obviously our other important elements are around communications. If we're not adequately communicating this uh, to our supply chain directly and bringing more people to this conversation, uh, we will not be successful. And likewise, uh, if we don't build upon this initiative to continue to improve transparency, uh, trust, and deliver truthful and accurate information to our consumers, uh, we, will, we will also be challenged going forward if that is not one of our ultimate outcomes. Next, you'll see uh, project support. Uh, we've uh, had the uh, great opportunity to support about 15 different uh, research projects and pilot projects along the way. So as we've been building this in parallel to this, many of the members of the roundtable have uh, put in some, some test case scenarios in the supply chain to evaluate, in some cases, just bits and pieces of these, this draft framework. In other cases, they've tried to assemble some pilot projects that start at the ranch and go all the way uh, to the retail and, and consumer space. So but very, uh, very, very uh, interesting there in terms of the, the, the different types of projects that uh, we've approved and supported, um, and uh, look forward to the progress that those projects will continue to make. And then lastly, as you see kind of a, a line here uh, where we've um, labeled it external opportunities, one important element as far as how the beef roundtable was structured in the U.S. was to ensure that it focused on the development of the tools and resources in setting these priorities. But the beef roundtable itself, it doesn't own cattle, it doesn't market beef, it does not enter into business agreements, it does not have direct consumer touch points. Those are all the members of the organization. So as an organization, uh, because it cannot enter into those types of agreements and marketing opportunities and claims, if you will, that's left to our members themselves to enter, uh, to, to uh, pursue those opportunities as much as they see uh, as far as the future opportunities um, in the business to business relationships that they have. So if they want to take this and implement it at a higher level within their specific supply chains and uh, conduct some additional verification or certification activities, then they have the, the full opportunity to do that. But it's not uh, outlined as being within the scope of the round table. Here's the current uh, members. Uh, as I mentioned, it's about 115 <coughs> members. Uh, many of you will recognize the major <coughs> brands listed at the top of the slide. Uh, if I ask you to raise your hand and, and to, as to whether or not you've either purchased uh, beef or a hamburger or, uh, or uh, any, in, in any other uh, type of uh, beef product, I would suspect that pretty well all of you would raise your hands that you've at least uh, interacted with some of these retailers and food fast uh, food service uh, entities. Next, we have the packers and processors. So all of the, the major entities that uh, process a significant amount of the beef in the country participate in the round table. The middle category, which encompasses about uh, a, a, almost half of the slide, and, and this is in some respects not by accident because it became essential early on to ins help ensure that we had strong producer support and participation in this uh, roundtable initiative. So about 50% uh, of the members are producers themselves or uh, producer organizations. 
Uh, you will recognize, uh, I think, uh, again, even in that space, uh, several of the logos that, that represent uh, many of the major players in the industry when it comes to cattle producers. The next category are allied industry uh, uh, companies, uh, a, a good cross-section of uh, all types of technology companies, uh, feed companies, uh, uh, the coordination and collaboration across the, the feed industry, uh, and the dairy industry also identified there as a, as a couple of call-outs. And then lastly, our civil society sector encompasses the universities, the research institutions, the non-governmental organizations, uh, those voices both that need to be heard that bring both environmental uh, conservation perspectives uh, to the conversation, consumer perspectives, and then of course the strong uh, science base that all of this work needs to be based on. Those logos on that previous slide then, uh, as we've uh, looked at the analytics on this, represent about 30% of the cattle herd, uh, more than 20 billion pounds of beef processed in the U.S., and more than 100 million consumer touch points uh, across the U.S. As we've uh, then uh, looked to say, okay, so now we have this organization that has this very extensive membership. Uh, everybody's come to the table for the purposes of advancing uh, beef sustainability in the U.S. How do we assemble that in a way that we can structure this conversation and, uh, and, and uh, reach some of these goals? So our, our stakeholder engagement uh, is illustrated here in this diagram where we start with the cow-calf producers, includes really all of the ranching uh, sector, uh, the auction markets, which there are many, many auction markets across the country that at some point in time um, market, that annually market about uh, 30 million head of cattle a year. Uh, cattle feed yards, again, um, uh, located across the U.S., uh, many of them in the central United States and, and western U.S. Packer processors, our retail food service members, and then lastly those two categories that I highlighted on the previous slide, our civil society and allied industry members. With collective engagement uh, representing all of these key stakeholders, over the course of the four, past four years, we've had approximately 250 people that have devoted time to the, and energy into this process. Um, that, that, that Now, I should have commented earlier before I put up all of these nice graphics uh, that have uh, 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 great design elements in them and make this process look very simple and easy to communicate. Rest assured, it was not. <laughs> and so we, we had uh, numerous uh, meetings, in-person meetings, uh, conference calls now at this point in time that are, are beyond the number which we uh, uh, continue to track. But uh, nonetheless, uh, it's, it's really created an opportunity to unite around this uh, beef sustainability conversation and develop something that the entire industry can be proud of. As it's already been uh, alluded to, our, uh, and I mentioned, our annual meeting is next week. We will officially launch this sustainability framework under the URL of beefsustainability.us. Um, as, as, as part of this uh, launch next week, uh, this, this website will, uh, will go up, as well as uh, many of the other summary documents that we've built around this. So there's uh, some, the, the framework itself gets fairly extensive. Uh, many of you will have an interest in possibly reading the entire document, but others perhaps just want some high-level uh, snippets of information about what the roundtable does. So it, it, in, it, it, alongside of this, we will have uh, some two-page summaries, some 20-page uh, summaries, other documents that you know, you'll be able to utilize uh, depending on what group or, or conversation you might plan to enter into around uh, beef sustainability. As we did this then, uh, uh, through this effort, um, and as we also just, with a, through an electronic voting process of the membership, approved this framework so that it could be launched at the meeting next week, uh, the, the membership voted 100% in favor of approving the framework that the organization had developed. So we had strong support. We, did, we had uh, no members voted against. Of, of all the members that voted, 100% of them have voted in favor of approving the entire package of information that we've assembled here. So that starts with this definition around sustainable beef, uh, the high priority indicators, these metrics, and then sustainability assessment guides. This, this slide uh, includes some of the, at this point in the process, when you said, when it's been said 10 years ago, it was that we were in the room trying to say, well, what is it? Well, it's environmental, social, and economic. All right, we get that. 
But I'd really draw your attention to the second sentence uh, in, the, in the first paragraph uh, on this slide, where it helps us put, a little, put it in more context, especially when we're talking to cattle producers and businesses that are operating every day. What does this sustainability word mean to me? Because this is the sentence I think that really best describes what we live. And, and the sentence says, this means sustainable beef comes from profitable farmers, ranchers, and businesses committed to optimizing resources and caring for animals and the environment, employees, and communities. That's a sentence that doesn't have uh, a, a lot of uh, buzzwords in it. It's, it's tangible words that mean something to them about being profitable, the fact that they are businesses, whether they're small businesses, medium or large businesses, that they uh, definitely depend on all types of natural resources to be successful, that they have to care for animals and the environment and their people and be engaged in their communities. As the Dean spoke earlier in his opening remarks, these livestock operations are not only part of, they are ingrained in the rural communities throughout the United States. Next, we, uh, so that became our founding definition. Next uh, where the, was this uh, work on the high priority indicators. Uh, this too was a fairly easy process where we started with 160 different topic areas uh, with 75 people in the room, October 20th of 2015, in case you're, in case you're interested. It's kind of like a child's birthday. Uh, so we gave birth to this organization through these high pro this high priority indicator process facilitated by Dr. Matlock. Um, and a, a very interesting, I encourage you if you ever have the opportunity to get involved in these, especially with, whether they're in the formation days like this one was or as we continue to, to do work going forward. Uh, it's, just, it's just a tremendous learning opportunity and especially a learning opportunity to reconnect what has become a fairly compartmentalized supply chain. So part of that struggle of putting those 75 people in the room on October 20th of 2015 was that uh, it, it became evident that this compartmentalization, uh, not even from even just from one segment to the next, had become has become such that we know very little bit, very little about what a cow calf producer does, what a retailer does, and if you to put that in even a, um, maybe a little stronger context of it's the date 1950 was referenced earlier when there was a lot of hunger in the world. Uh, there was a need, need to drive inner innovation and disruption. Well, what the beef supply chain itself, if you look at the year 1950, just 70 years ago, short period of time relative to our existence, I always refer to it as consisted of two, two segments of the supply chain. So when my dad was born in the Texas Hill Country in the house in Stonewall, uh, the, the family farm and ranch was one segment of the supply chain. The local butcher in town was the second segment of the supply chain. That was it. There was nothing else. Now we have seed stock producers, commercial cow calf producers, we have uh, uh, stocker operators, backgrounders, cattle feed yards, packers, <coughs> processors, distributors, retailers, food service, the list goes on. So because of that, we were right here in a very small slice of just being able to communicate from one step to the next. Now it's much more diverse. So as part of that uh, challenge then, those 160 sticky notes that we put on the wall became these six high priority indicators. Water resources, land resources, air and greenhouse gas emissions, efficiency and yield, animal health and well-being, and employee safety and well-being. Now what I want to do here just in the next, say, two minutes is just barely touch on a few of these because you'll have access to publicly, have public access to all this information a week from today and I encourage you to look at it and ask us any questions. But structurally, uh, all of the sectors were tasked with bringing forward metrics specific to their segment of the supply chain that addressed each of these six indicators. Now we set that, we set that rule when we, we, we uh, held the sectors to it as much as we could. There's, a, there's one exception, but there's a lot, it's a logical exception and I'll touch on it uh, <coughs> maybe just very briefly. But with that, uh, th this is the, the structure throughout the framework, and an example of that then under water resources for the cow-calf sector is a grazing management plan or equivalent being implemented that maintains or improves water, water resources. So grazing management becomes an important theme in the cow-calf sector uh, throughout uh, these uh, sustainability metrics. Um, in the auction market sector, 
Again, I've kind of, so I'm going to kind of skip some of the list of metrics and just give you an example of a few of them. So their focus here on animal health and well-being, as, there's, <coughs> as I mentioned, roughly 30 million head of cattle that are marketed through our auction markets every year. That's a lot of human-animal uh, interactions and touch points, so it's important that uh, cattle are handled appropriately uh, in all the sectors, but especially in the auction market sector as they work with cattle, different cattle every week, every day. And uh, their focus here on the, the, the BQA principles, so on the beef quality assurance program uh, that the industry has built, and the Livestock and Marketing Association's uh, care and, and handling guidelines that they've established for all the livestock auctions. Now, Nick, another example then transitioning to the feed yard sector is on efficiency and yield. So why in our overarching kind of definition that I put up there earlier, we do use the word profitability, nothing wrong with that, but profitability is very much a competitive uh, metric. So we're not able to uh, identify it specifically as a standalone metric, yet it's important that we do focus on the things that help drive profitability, and that is in improving efficiencies and yield. Here the example, a focus on animal and proper animal nutrition, growth and production, optimizing uh, use of our feed resources and uh, our, uh, our gain, uh, feed to gain ratios. The next uh, two here just to touch on, one is on the packer processors, so an example on water resources. You'll note here this is just slightly different. The packer processors and the retailers actually put tiered metrics in their, uh, the way that they design them. So they have level one, two, and three as far as metrics within each of the uh, six indicator areas. But here's just the example of uh, water resource management plans. Uh, are they implemented at the facility? And of course, uh, some description around that as far as what that means to the packer pack and processing sector. And then uh, likewise, uh, the retail uh, 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 space also has a similar, similar type of metrics. And again, the three levels uh, for each category. So through this process, uh, I, I already broke the news to you that we've officially approved it as an organization, uh, but through that collective work over the past four years, uh, we had we had been through five different internal public comment periods, uh, two uh, public open public comment periods for a total of over 1,800 comments that we considered to help uh, uh, modify and make improvements to, to the work that we've done here. This will be the website that you'll see uh, next week under beefsustainability.us. And then for our, uh, the year going forward, uh, now that we will have finalized this and launched this uh, in a public way, will be uh, the focus on outreach, um, development of additional tools and resources. So there are some self-assessment tools for each uh, sector that are under development. And uh, the last two items there, uh, communications always being important as I touched on earlier. The last one I'll, I'll make a mention of because it, it's intended to build upon the existing, in, you know, existing programs that exist in the industry. So the roundtable has established a process where existing programs can come in, make application to the roundtable to demonstrate that they're already in alignment with these indicators and metrics. Concept being there that there's no need to build things from scratch if you already have programs that exist in the industry or exist um, in, in some of the stakeholder groups that can be recognized uh, by the round table. It may be a little bit short notice for you to go to the round annual uh, general assembly meeting next week in Fresno, April 30th, May 1st and 2nd, but uh, it's not too late for you to make plans to go to next year's annual meeting, which is set for Orlando, April 28th through the 30th. Um, we look forward to having many of y'all participate in this process, whether directly over the next, uh, get engaged in, in the next several months, or, or participate in our annual meeting uh, as we move that to different locations in the country. So, thank you. Okay, our uh, presenters have done a wonderful job of giving us an outline of the many activities and the approaches that they're taking to sustainability. Now is a chance for uh, you to uh, ask some questions about uh, them or to them about the, what you've heard and what you're thinking about uh, sustainability and the programs you work on. So, uh, any questions? Oh, go ahead. Yes. Great presentations. Thank you very much. So as you have worked through the development of your programs, 
have any of you or all of you truth these through market research, communication funds, whether it be the messages or, or, or the progress, and, and gotten feedback in, in, in regard to is it making a difference, should we need to change it? I know, ben, I know you, you, there was an outreach to, to, to anybody, I think, I got an email about it, about your, your principles, those kind of things. But have, have you all done that in any way, shape, or form? So, uh, start from field to market's perspective. Uh, as if you all can hear, I can project a little bit more. Um, as we have developed our framework and approach, uh, it's ensuring that the verification and assurance elements are there to ensure kind of the credibility of the claim. And so, we feel that the role of civil society um, and academia to help shore that up is a critical part of that process. Um, I'll be honest with all of you, we're still building this plane as we're flying it. Um, and so, you know, some of, some of the work that needs to be borne out is both, are we increasing consumer confidence, which I think I hear is the, the nature of your question, um, but also we want to see a skill to market. So our national indicators report was published in 2016. We just had the release of the ag census just two weeks ago. Uh, thanks, government shut down for delaying that. Uh, but now that we have that data, we're going to be looking now to publish in 2021, are, are we moving the needle? And I think that speaks for itself. We have to document and demonstrate our improvement. It isn't just enough to say we are sustainable, we have to show it. And so that measurement component is so vital from our perspective. And so thinking about how um, the whole of agriculture can get behind a similar approach, I think can also help strengthen that consumer confidence and build that trust. Yep. Paul, so good, good question. Uh, on the front end of this, we, we've utilized consumer market research to make sure that we are at least working in areas that align with uh, things that are important for them. Um, so so we, we, we have been able to build on that because, and that is, in, has included uh, taking some of that consumer data and breaking it down more than just uh, the word sustainability. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, driving down into well, what's important? Animal care, as an example, usually tops uh, comes n near the top of that list. And so we, we've done that to ensure we're working, help kind of verify that we're working in the right priority areas, and that those align with the businesses and the organizations that operate in the supply chain. Uh, now I think though uh, we, we would need to take what we've done uh, amongst the entities that have developed what they think is important to them, what's meaningful to their operations. And we had, to, we had to kind of get through this milestone, I think, before we can transition to the next milestone of now. Uh, we had to make it meaningful to our supply chain first. Now we had to figure out how to make it meaningful and communicate it in a meaningful way to our consumers. Thank you, Paul, for the question. It is an excellent question and something that we've wrestled with strategically is that if you're going to get your message out to the 300 plus million Americans, how do you do that? And one of the strategies we took as we came down this uh, route of not only marketing our pork products but also the sustainability space is we partnered with Google and spent millions of do dollars with Google Analytics and they can do something called social listening. And so for a guy that doesn't have a Facebook page, it's very interesting what Google knows about you, mm. more than you'll ever know. And so we actually did target research with Google to, to analyze what are the online social spaces talking about pig farmers or live pigs. We found some interesting things, animal well-being being a real big priority for them, but what do you think the number one Google search for anything pigs or pork is? Bacon. How to cook a pork chop. Oh. And I put that in context for you because you may have seen, not off topic, but to tie why it matters to us is you've noticed that the National Pork Board's done a lot of messaging on cooking at 145 as opposed to where most folks cook it at 160 and it makes for a bad eating experience. Google helped us change that paradigm and thinking, well, same thing we're doing in the sustainability space. Now, We've also realized, though, strategically, efficiently, and effective to message to those 300 plus consumer, 300 million plus consumers is a challenge. So we've changed our strategy a little bit in that we've identified a thousand food influencers within the channel, in which we call on every day in the supply chain, and trying to make sure that we're credible and we're a resource for them moving forward to help them make decisions and protecting their brand before it becomes an announcement. 
thus in turn relying on them to communicate to the greater masses. So really, the food channel and that thousand people that we've identified is where we've focused our efforts. And to measure that success, we've been doing a lot of pre and post survey work in terms of what is their paradigm or what is their thoughts prior to us working with them and now past in the sustainability space. Good. Next question. Rick? I'm curious, this is for anyone who wants to respond. Um, in conversations with producers or producer groups, sometimes you'll hear, well, we just want the industry to get to a point where we can say we are sustainable, we've met a bar, and, and now we can brand ourselves as sustainable. Or we're compared to the discussion about continuous improvement and moving the needle, and uh, I'm interested in seeing how much that came into play in your various efforts. So to repeat the question for those who did, maybe didn't hear it, it's a matter of uh, setting a bar versus uh, continuous improvement. Where we are now a sustainable yep. versus uh, the public uh, versus uh, continuous improvement, moving the needle, that kind of thing. Okay. So, Rick, I think when it comes to the way we've had that discussion in the, the beef space is that uh, we really consider these to be complementary efforts. And what I mean by these is our work that the roundtable is doing to try to take and break this uh, apart, make it meaningful for each individual operation throughout every segment of the supply chain so that they individually can contribute. But yet that that's uh, paired with the ongoing work of the periodic LCA updates. So, so it, it, you know, it's, it will be a, a, it would be a struggle perhaps uh, uh, not impossible, but, but close, to suggest that we would ever be able to ascertain information from the, directly from the 730,000 cow-calf producers are out there. So let's just say that, that perhaps that's an unrealistic expectation and a path we're not going to go down. Uh, but yet we can arm them, uh, cro uh, all of them, with this type of information to help themselves and help the industry. And then through the proper uh, science and engineering of LCA analysis, we can uh, periodically take a snapshot of the industry to see how these uh, efforts are working in parallel and partnership to help uh, continuously improve the industry. And I would add from the conversations that we're having with producers, um, I, often, I often get that response directly from farmers. Well, I am sustainable. I wouldn't still be farming um, now sixth or seventh generation of my family. Can't you just tell everyone that? Uh, and I think what we want to do is, is to, to document and demonstrate that stewardship, um, but then also how do we pivot those learnings back to other producers. Uh, and, and so I think we, as we think about the performance curve, we have that tail end that's defining the story for everyone else. Uh, and so that's really the opportunity to really focus on the lens of innovation for sustainability and, and that uh, there is, uh, I think, operational uh, efficiencies and uh, productivity, profitability benefits that go along with this that make that um, I think desire to be uh, rubber stamped to sustainable to say, hey, you are committed to continuous improvement in what you do every day. We're trying to put language around this for sustainability to also help you tell that story just alongside the same um, innovation pursuit that you're pursuing. I would just bolt on to those comments by saying our producer-led task force of 15 influential people said we really want to stay away from label claims or disparaging our pig farming brethren. Really, we want to talk about stewardship and continuous improvement. And that was confirmed for us when we brought in our NGO partners and the retail partners that they said, listen, we've made some big, hairy, audacious goals that we will do this by such date. And in all transparency, that's a goal. But if we don't hit it, we're not as concerned with that. What we're concerned as some of the biggest retailers in the world is that we can demonstrate that we are improving in our supply chain. And so that gave us confidence as pig farmers that we're united, but also that in terms of the people that are buying our product, that's their philosophy as well. It's okay to set goals. Maybe you don't make it, that's not a failure. Did you improve? And so to me, that helps align from the farm all the way to the, the major retailers. What kind of mechanism do you have to deal with poor performers? How do you deal with poor performers? 
let me be honest, uh, you know, I think many of our approaches are voluntary. Uh, and so in, in that model, it's trying to um, ensure that the right resources, training, um, guidance is available to uh, help ensure that, that bad actors um, don't, don't occur. Uh, the challenge with that is uh, you, you can't necessarily um, uh, solve every, every instance of that challenge. So transparency, I think, is another key piece of that puzzle. And, and so where can we focus our united efforts on um, where we're doing well, but also where is greater uh, partnership, collaboration, support needed um, to help uh, ensure improvement over time. And so from Field to Market's perspective, it's a voluntary program. Um, there's, we want to see the whole of agriculture moving forward in, in terms of sustainability performance. And so it's starting where you're at um, and looking for those opportunities for improvement. Um, and I would say the greatest opportunities exist with our poorest uh, producers or baddest actors. And so um, where, where we can find opportunities to help support that, I think, is, is the opportunity. Well said. I think that's an excellent question. And it's a hard answer. And I will be very transparent with you that that's a, that's a question that was brought before our We Care Task Force. Someone mentioned as a producer, what do we do with quote unquote, thank you, Betsy, is bad actors. And right away, that question got put in the parking lot. And we had multiple meetings over a course of a year and never got to the point where we could answer that. What we did is we decided we need to make sure that our leaders lead by example. And to be quite frank, if you are a bad actor, I think your freedom to operate goes away. Mm -hmm. and so not thinking of it in a regulatory way, think of it in a proactive leadership by example way. And if you don't meet what the consumer demands today in traceability, transparency, and trust, you'll soon be out of business is the strategic approach we've taken. I'm gonna ask uh, one question, then we're gonna do the last one for you guys. Uh, you know, what are some of the research questions or challenge, technology challenges that you see need to be addressed by uh, the research and education people that are in the room. I can start off. Uh, we rely on publicly available data uh, to develop our national indicators report. Uh, that works very well when that data is robust and comprehensive. Uh, that is more challenging uh, in indicators like soil carbon, water quality, biodiversity, where we don't have adequate uh, data at a national level. Um, in some cases, we're seeing states step up to take on, um, you know, how can they support from a State Department of Agriculture, uh, uh, better, better availability of what's happening uh, in their state. Uh, but as we can think about, are there creative ways to partner together um, to ensure that we are filling in those data gaps? Um, Field to Market has a science advisory council that is engaging with the broader scientific community to uh, really identify what are some of those critical research needs or gaps um, that fundamentally we would like to come together with others uh, to help solve. And so um, as we can help make that available to this community, uh, once those research gaps are identified, happy to share those with uh, Dr. Cordes. Um, but uh, one, one of the big opportunities, I think, is increasing uh, data where, where those gaps exist and those key indicators. I think from a research and technology point of view, uh, clearly, uh, as, and as I already mentioned and has been mentioned, that the LCAs have already demonstrated significant progress in, in many areas when it comes to our production practices and our efficiencies. Uh, but, uh, but that journey itself is not not done either. Uh, and when you look at our, our uh, six key areas, I think there's plenty of opportunity for, for uh, ongoing research and technolo technological advancements to help us in those key three environmental spaces, water, land, and air resources, uh, mitigation practices as, as, as needed uh, that are uh, economically feasible themselves and, and, and can be uh, sustained as practices within our operations. And then uh, definitely when it comes to our people, you know, people, uh, when you look at, uh, m m especially in the live uh, animal part of the, the supply chain and, and even the, in the processing and retail section, really across the whole board, 
our people and, and uh, providing a, a workplace um, and a livable wage that's, uh, that's uh, satisfactory to them and, and not only satisfactory but draws new people into the industry. So things that we can do from a technology point of view to even help with, with uh, automation and, and ease some of the, the task and workload of our employees. I think uh, the more we'll, uh, we'll see you know, new people um, that have uh, more, more uh, interest in the technology side of the business that want to participate in our supply chain. And obviously uh, all those things help our, on our last indicator help drive our uh, efficiency and our yield uh, throughout the supply chain. Thank you for the question. I'm going to take a little different approach and it's just real world of what I deal with daily. In terms of technology, we have lots of tools available to us as pig farmers. And when I think about the sustainability space, I have someone calling me weekly on the latest dashboard or the latest tool to mine on-farm data and then to house it. And so one of the challenges I have from a technology perspective is which, which uh, vendor do you use? Which portal do you use? Which dashboard do you use? So navigating that, which makes the most sense in terms of efficiency and effectiveness of use. And then I would say this whole idea of big data. The supply chain continues to ask for big data. We have the ability to supply that. And this is an age old program or problem that some of you are aware of here in the audience. But when I go to a farmer and say, I want you to supply that big data through this tool that we've chosen to report to the supply chain, I as a pig farmer and others say, well, that data has to have value. That's my whole livelihood in that data. So what's the value of that data? Where is it housed? How, it's, how is it protected? And how is it utilized moving forward? And so I believe from our space, we have lots of tools. We're trying to unite around which tool to use and how to make sure that our producers garner value out of the data that the supply chain is requesting. Well, I'd like to thank our panelists for uh, their presentations and questions.